The following lecture is brought to you by the Boot Camp Subcommittee of the Committee on Resident Education of the Society of Neurological Surgeons. Spine injuries may occur at different locations. Each type has a particular neurological sequelae. Cervical with brainstem, cord, or root, thoracic with cord or root, and lumbar with conus or root. Cord injuries can vary from asymptomatic to complete functional transection, with incomplete syndromes in between. More specifically, incomplete cord syndromes are central cord, anterior cord, brown saccard, posterior cord, and conus epiconus. Spine injuries may be either muscular ligamentous, with contusions, strains, sprains, and complete ligamentous disruption, plus minus dislocation, or fractures, which may be stable or unstable. Here is a diagram showing the soft tissue layers that may be injured in muscular ligamentous spine injuries. The key spine ligaments, from ventral to dorsal, are anterior longitudinal posterior longitudinal, ligamentum flavum, interspinous, and supraspinous. Facet joints may also be injured. The indications to image the spine after trauma are as follows. Clinical indications, spine region pain, neurologic deficit, either radicular or cord, severe multi-system injuries, and altered mental status. Clinical rationale, prevent cord and root injury, prevent incapacitating deformity and pain. Which patients need imaging of the cervical spine? Here's a case example to help illustrate some indications. The patient had mild to moderate trauma, no loss of consciousness, a normal mental status, no neck pain or tenderness, and neurologically intact. In this case, no imaging is needed. The next patient had mild to moderate trauma, however has altered mental status, neck pain with tenderness, and neurologic symptoms. In this case, imaging is needed. The next patient had severe multi-system trauma. In this case, imaging is needed. Radiographic tools should be selected based on their ability to detect particular types of injury. For bony injury with fractures and dislocations, x-rays and CT scan are preferred. For ligamentous injury, MRI and flexion extension films are preferred. For disc injury, MRI and CT myelogram are preferred. There are seven cervical vertebra with a lordotic curve. There are 12 thoracic vertebra with a kyphotic curve. There are five lumbar vertebra with a lordotic curve. When assessing spinal alignment, use the following lines to guide you. Prevertebral fascia, anterior marginal line, posterior marginal line, spinal laminar line, and posterior spinous line. One should also assess vertebral body width and spinal cord diameter. Here are images of a normal cervical spine alignment. One must assess the occiput to T1, bone integrity, the alignment of the vertebral bodies, lamina, and facets. The curve should be lordotic. Discs and transverse foramen should be noted. The subaxial cervical spine consists of C3 to C7. Here are diagrams showing the important anatomic landmarks as well as the annulus fibrosus and nucleus pulposus, which comprise the disc. 
Here is an example of ligamentous injury without fracture. In this situation, instability is possible even with a normal CT, and thus an early MRI is helpful. The goal here is to stabilize the neck until the pain resolves and assess competence of ligaments with flexion extension films or MRI. Here is an example of unilateral facet disruption. Bilateral facet fracture dislocation may lead to jumped or locked facets, as seen on these images. Cervical spine subluxation, plus minus fracture, and major facet disruption may occur with trauma. The mechanism of injury is usually flexion. Burst fractures may occur with trauma. The mechanism of injury is usually axial loading. Cord contusion may occur with trauma. The mechanism is usually extension. The upper cervical spine, C1 and C2, have unique anatomy, as illustrated here. A C1 Jefferson fracture occurs with axial loading. It's often associated with C2 fractures. In this condition, it is key to assess the transverse ligament. C2 odontoid fractures and subluxations may be divided into three types. One is through the tip of the dens, two is through the base of the dens, and three is through the body of C2. C2 hangman's fractures typically result from hyperextension and axial loading. It involves bilateral C2 pars interarticularis fractures. It is considered unstable when there are greater than 3.5 millimeters of subluxation of C2 on C3 and or greater than 11 degrees of angulation noted. Atlantoaxial subluxation is defined by the atlantodental interval ADI. On the left, you see a normal variant with ADI less than 3 millimeters. On the right is an example of C12 subluxation. Note the expanded ADI. Thoracic and lumbar vertebra each have unique anatomy, as illustrated in these images. In these regions, minor fractures may involve the transverse process, spinous process, minimal compression fractures, and end plate fractures. Conceptually, it is important to understand the Dennis three column model of the thoracolumbar spine. The first column, anterior, includes the ALL and anterior half of the vertebral body. The second or middle column includes the posterior half of the vertebral body and PLL. The third and posterior column includes the pedicle, facets, pars, lamina, spinous process, and interspinous ligaments. According to this model, one column injury is usually stable, two column injury is usually unstable, and three column injury is unstable. Fractures in this region may be classified by mechanism of injury. A. Compression, B. Distraction, and C. Rotation. Class A. Vertebral body compression may be divided into compression fractures and burst fractures. A compression fracture results from anterior column failure. The middle and posterior columns remain intact. This fracture is unstable if greater than 50% compression or greater than 20 degrees of angulation exist. A burst fracture involves anterior and middle column failure. Bone is retropulsed into the canal. Consequently, these patients often have neurological deficits and are unstable. Here is a diagram and radiographic images demonstrating the mechanism of injury for burst fractures with bone retropulsion and canal compromise. Class B, distraction with flexion extension, may be divided into flexion, distraction injuries, for example, chance or seatbelt injury, and hyperextension injuries. 
These injuries involve all three columns and are by definition unstable. Here is a diagram and radiographic image demonstrating the mechanism of injury for flexion distraction and posterior ligamentous injury. Class C is a three column injury with rotation. It is a fracture dislocation shear injury. It is unstable and typically results in neurologic deficit. Here is a diagram and radiographic image demonstrating the mechanism of injury for fracture dislocation. In summary, no normal spine anatomy, obtain appropriate studies with x-rays, CT, MRI, and flexion extension films, always assess stability both mechanical and neurologic, determine the integrity of the three columns and recognize fracture types associated by mechanism of injury.